You may be seated. Welcome to worship this morning, the second Sunday of Lent. During this time of Lent, we are inviting and reminding each other to move in concert with the rhythms of God's love and of the love that we know in Christ. As we gather this morning to remember the call to prayer, let us begin worship with Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in season and their leaves In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so. They are like the chaff that is blown away. And they will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us move into worship together, rising in body and or in spirit as we sing our first hymn. You may be seated. Please join your hearts with me in prayer. Ever-living, ever-loving, and everlasting God, we confess this morning that we are a bit weary with the world around us. Pandemic, injustice, and, us, and unrest weighs on our hearts with heavy sighs. Sustain us with your grace this morning. Sustain us 
in that everlasting way as we pray together. This morning, we offer prayers of healing for Jean Mastain, Kay Boschert, Tegan Goodermont, and Dick Schmoder as they heal, O oh God, may you surround them with your ever-loving arms. We pray to, O oh God, in moments of celebration. And so this morning, we are grateful for the birth of Bryn Elizabeth, and we celebrate with Sean Allard and Jean Allard. We pray to, O oh God, for prayers of comfort for those who mourn, for the family of Judy Weir, Carol Meyer at the death of her sister-in-law, Bequita Collar, for the Buck brothers at the death of his brother-in-law, Leo Collins, for anyone who is walking a grief journey in this season, we pray, oh God, give them comfort. Lift us with our prayers this morning. Lift us out of our weariness and into hope. When we encounter chaos around us, Give us the courage to pray for calm. When we encounter unrest around us, may we know peace. When we encounter despair around us, may we be beacons of hope. When we encounter anxiousness, may we dare to pray for joy. And may, when we encounter weariness, O oh God, help us to pray for courage, the courage to move through and move on. In all circumstances, may we be rooted in your everlasting love, the love that you have for us and the love that you give to this world. Sustain us this morning as we pray, and may we pray boldly. The prayer that your son Jesus taught us how to pray, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive, forgive our debtors. And lead us not into the time, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, a hearty welcome to everyone this morning. Whether you are joining us in the pews or whether you are joining us by live stream, we are glad that you are here today. And my sincerest hope and prayer for each and every one of you is that you feel as if this morning that you are coming home to the heart of God and a place that will always welcome you in. We are glad that you are here. And online folks, we are glad that you are here as well. I can't say enough about what is going on with the church. There's more announcements, so check your bulletin. And uh, most importantly, consider signing up for the e-news because that is the best way to get the most updated information on everything that's happening in our church community. Um, you can do that online, on our website. I highly recommend it. It's the most updated information. This morning, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. First, our wonderful deacon board has taken the time for the Lenten season to prepare a Stations of the Cross. Um, the art is on that corner of the meeting house, and there's a brochure that goes with it. Um, it's really uh, quite wonderful. The, the artist um, is Judy Lahneman, and it's uh, some pretty interesting woodblock print. And uh, the deacons have taken the time to sort of connect some social justice issues to each of the Stations of the Cross. So I highly recommend that. Uh, also, if you have been visiting our community and you have enjoyed being here, worshiping and taking classes, and you would like to consider membership in the church, our next membership class is going to happen uh, the last two Sundays in March with um, joining the first Sunday in April. So if that is of interest to you, and I, again, I will say to the live stream folks, like sitting in the pew is not a requirement of membership. If you have enjoyed being online with us on Sunday mornings, um, you can consider that as well. And people should talk to you, Sarah, right? Or, yeah, so if you're interested in that, talk to Sarah. Um, and our final announcements, I don't know if you know, but we have been doing monthly faith and family classes um, for our caregivers, our parents, our grandparents. And this particular month, we have a very special thing coming up. Tonight, we are going to be showing a movie called My Ascension. And we'll have our regular Wednesday. It's going to be kind of a talk-back session. Um, and, you know, the movie is, is about um, suicide, and our talk-back is going to be about mental health. And I'm going to invite Nicole Smalley up to talk to us a little more about it. She is our director of middle school youth. So. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Hello. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, well, yes. Thank you, Kathy. I'm so excited to share a little bit more about this month's Faith and Family. And like Kathy said, it's two parts. So we're kicking off tonight with this movie called My Ascension, which tells the story of 16-year-old Emma, who was left paralyzed after a suicide attempt. And it shares her story of learning to walk again and spreading hope in light of the fact that 20 young people die from suicide every day. 20 young people die from suicide every single day. And I know that statistic is scary, and it also might make you feel a little uncomfortable because we're not supposed to talk about it, right? We don't want to say the wrong thing or feel like we're planting some kind of idea. But in reality, the only way to change that statistic is by talking about it. 
and to keep talking about it. So that's why we're hosting this event and why we're following it up with part two on Wednesday. So if you can't come to the movie, you can come to part two on Wednesday, but that's going to be a panel of experts who can answer our questions and share their expertise from school administration to pastoral care and professional mental health. Resources from within this congregation who can guide us on how we can best show up for our kids and our students. Mm. But it doesn't take an expert to show up for our kids and our students. And that's why this Faith and Family event is not just for parents either. It's for the whole church family to come together. Because I happen to know that this church is filled with incredible people like all of you and like those who are watching online who want to make sure that this is a place where every single young person who walks through the doors feels safe and feels belonging and feels loved. And I know that because I lived it for myself. Growing up here in this church, this was that safe place for me. And I know we want to continue to be that place who doesn't just talk about God's love to kids, but shows them what it looks like. So I'll wrap up. It's a little, it's a little long, so I know one gives me a microphone. But I'll wrap it up by just saying, here's a little picture of how I would view success for an event like this. I would love on Wednesday night, when middle school youth group meets, I would love to be able to show them a picture of all the adults who, not, along with their wonderful parents, but other adults in the church who came to this movie or who came to this panel. So I could show them an actual photo, not just tell them the number of views or the number of likes, but show them the actual people who showed up and the actual people who wanted to learn about mental health so that we can be better prepared to care for them. I think that would be a powerful sign of trust for our kids and for our students and for their parents and caretakers as well that this church really means it when we say to them, you are a beloved child of God and you mm. belong here and we want you to be here. So the movie tonight is at 6 p.m. in the Pond Room and then the panel is 6.30 on Wednesday. Everyone and anyone is invited, so feel free to bring guests. And I'll be around after church to answer any questions, and Kathy can also answer any questions. Thank you. I think the pandemic has really put the mental health of our children at the forefront of conversations that we have. So we really, really hope that you will join us. And now I'm going to invite George up to dismiss our kids to God's garden. All right, good morning, church. This is our time, uh, and good morning to our friends online as well, uh, and our kids online. We see you and we love you. Um, this is our time where we do our God's garden. So we invite our friends in pre-K through fifth grade to come on down. You can stand right here on the corner of the stage, and congregation, we are going to sing our God's garden song together. All right, here we go. Come, oh come, come to the garden, gather round, come without fear, known by name here in God's garden, all are welcome here. Amazing. Friends, let's go to our God's garden today. Okay. Two. Have fun, kids. <laughs> it is amazing that we worship a God from everlasting to everlasting, one who can give us hope in all times. And not only give us hope, but bring us the peace that passes understanding. And so let us stand and share that peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all.
The scripture this morning is from Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and for everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Our Father, which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us all our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Indeed, God, may your name be holy. And may we live our lives as such and in response. For it's in your name that we live and move and breathe. Amen. I have always loved poetry. In fact, I remember the first book of poetry I ever got from the bookstore trip that I took with my dad. Some of you may know it. Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. I will inaccurately give a reaccounting of my favorite poem. I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. I have the measles and the mumps, a gash, a rash, and purple bumps. My mouth is wet, my throat is dry. I'm glowing blind in my right eye. My tonsils, they're as big as rocks. I've counted 16 chicken pox. And there's one more. That's 17. And don't you think my face looks green? 
I gasp and cough and sneeze and choke. I think that my left leg is broke. My hip hurts when I move my chin. My belly button is caving in. I gasp and, uh, what? What's that you say? You say today is Saturday? <laughs> Goodbye. I'm going out to play. So I missed like 20 lines, but <laughs> close enough. So one of the things I think I've always loved about poetry and about music as well is that it opens up an evocative space. I wouldn't have said that work, word back when I bought this book. But it opens up an evocative space that normal parlance and conversation doesn't have space for. I mean, I felt these feelings. I didn't want to go to school. But I didn't have as grandiose of an excuse list as this kid did, right? Poetry does that. It opens up something for us. Music, perhaps. Maybe it's neither of those for you, but do you know that space where you don't have words? But you know that it's sacred and holy and something beyond our rational minds is experiencing life. It makes me think about prayer. In the book of Romans, there's a verse that says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to pray. So the Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Sometimes I think prayer is that place where we don't have words either to name the longings or the hopes or the joys or the rage or grief or pain. For indeed, how does one have words to talk about families just like ours having to flee their homes because of war. I don't have words for that. But I have prayer. And I have groans and I trust that God hears the groans and longings of everyone around the world who longs for life and love and freedom and peace. Henry Nouwen, the Catholic priest and writer, once noted, I'm beginning to see that much of praying is grieving. It's that space where in the rhythm with the God of all love, the one who has created and sustained us, we can bring whatever we hold. Again, whether it is joy, longing, grief, pain. Trusting that God hears us and meets us in the place, both in our words, but then also beyond them. That God knows the words and actually doesn't even need them. Thinking of prayer and our turn to it in the midst of Lent is the invitation, even as the Our Father prayer and then him and also passage that we've read today. It's an invitation to move into that rhythm of faith, joining God. I love how at the end of the passage in Luke, it talks about that door, right? It's like the reality of God is always present everywhere. God is, right? God is within and around and surrounding. And sometimes we just need to open the door and be like, oh, that's what's going on? Prayer in so many ways is that opening of the door, that thin space between the world that we see and the world that is. And so we're invited to move into that dance, that rhythm, that space, to remember how we were meant to live, which is in connection with the God of all life and all love. And prayer isn't just something that we do here on Sunday mornings. As followers of Jesus, we are invited to live our lives so that our lives move in the rhythm with God. That's what prayer is about. It's about connecting us back to that rhythm, to the source of all life who is God. This is where we read in 1 Thessalonians, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
I remember when I was younger, I'd be like, okay, so how do I pray all the time? Like, am I supposed to just like walk around and be like, dear God, 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 dear God. you know, like that? Because I really wanted to, to do my faith right. And as I've gotten older, I've realized it's about what does it mean for us to live our lives as prayer, to live our lives fundamentally open and listening to what God is inviting us What's going on in our own spirits? How does God's spirit resonate and echo within ours, calling us to live, not disconnected, but at the threshold of the door where we jump in to the reality of who God is and the kingdom that God desires to make real here on earth. The passage that Don read for us is from the Lucan version of this prayer that we pray every Sunday. You actually can find it also in Matthew. And this is one of my favorite nerdy exercises that you can do with the Gospels. And any one of us can do it. It's really fun. So anytime you're reading in any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you can Google or whatever search engine. This is not an endorsement of Google. Uh, You can Google the passage that you're reading. And when you do that, what you can find out is that where it might be in other ones of the Gospels. And it's really fun to do that, I think, because you get to see how the different authors, in the midst of their message trying to talk about who Christ is and the invitation to faith, how they nuance it a little bit differently in view of their overall project. So even with this passage, then really, again, a fun exercise you can do is read from Matthew. Don't just read 6 to 13. See what's happening around 6 to 13. And the same thing for the Luke inversion, because you'll note they're not exactly the same. You may also have noticed uh, when the passage was read that it didn't match what we sang and what we pray every Sunday. Now we could do a whole sermon series, and in fact I know that when Daniel Harrell was the senior minister we did one, on the Lord's Prayer. That would be a long day, so I'm not going to go as in-depth as we possibly could, but I wanted to just highlight some things from this passage that I think speak to us about this rhythm of faith and the rhythm of prayer, getting our relationship in line with and in sync with the God of the universe. So just to go through the passage a little bit from Luke. When we get to the Lord's Prayer, it says, Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Heavenly Parent, may your name be set apart. Is another way to say, may your name be holy, Hallowed be your name. May your name be set apart. Your name isn't of this world, right? How later in the passage it says, hey, if you parents who are evil or human, if you know how to love, how much more does God? This set apartness is that same sort of echo reminding us that the ways of this earth are not our ways, or God's ways. So with that, as we come into this passage, There's a lot of things that could be said, but a couple of things I wanted to know is just how it's an affirmation of relationship. When we say our Father in heaven, it's talking about our heavenly parent, that we are fundamentally in prayer, invited to remember that we were meant for relationship with God. We were meant to live in that connection. And instead of God being some far-off cosmic being, The prayer reminds us that God is real and personal and loves us. And we're invited to move into that dance and rhythm. Also, if the name is set apart, there's a way in which it's affirming that this world and everything of it isn't necessarily directly in line with who God is. And so the prayer continues. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven also here on earth. Above the text there is the Greek version of it, and sometimes I love playing with that because it's a way to go back to the language. You know, the Lord's Prayer is familiar to many of us. But when you go back to it, what if you put it in your own language? How would you pray that prayer? What does it mean to affirm that we are people who want God's ways to be the ways of this earth? We long for that, for there to be love and peace and joy for there to be freedom. And so we pray for that, reminding ourselves, encouraging ourselves that God's way, God's kingdom is, no matter what is happening in the world, there is another kingdom. 
And we pray to remember that, to reconnect ourselves then to that desire for God's way, that God's way would be here on earth as well. The prayer continues, give us today the bread that is life. Forgive our sins as we forgive everyone. A thing I wanted to highlight is this, we usually say the daily bread. The Greek there, there's no other occurrence of that, and most translators and commentators don't really know what to do with it. It is definitely referring in a way to the story of the people of Israel that all the Christians, so-called that they became, would have known about, where God provided for them every single day what they needed. It's a reminder to us, again, that no matter what happens, God will be with us in what we need for this day, and also a challenge to us to not store up and hoard, but to live in that kind of openness to one another so that everyone may have bread to eat. But the Greek word here, in a way, is also an echo of when in the Hebrew Bible, when Moses meets God in the burning bush, the verb there and the way of saying God says, I am, or I am who I am or will be. It's also the underlying root for the name of God, Yahweh, here, it's the reminder that God is our source and sustenance, that the ground of God is everything that we need. And we need to remember that. There's a reminder to us that we have life rooted in God, and we can therefore live free. Knowing we are forgiven, so too then, as we continue in the passage, we forgive everyone who is also indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, the prayer continues. It's a reminder to us to live from that overflow, remaining in the rhythm of this God, being people of the kingdom here on earth, not being led into temptation and forgetting, but remembering. And the final line that's in this passage reads, but deliver us from the evil one. It's a call and an invitation to God to hold us in relationship, to keep us living with that door open, believing and trusting, moving in this rhythm. That's in so many ways what this prayer is about. It's reminding us of the rhythm of this God and inviting us to join in that dance of faith, the faith of relationship, a faith that longs for another kingdom and remembers that there is one, and that calls and reminds us to live our lives as answers to that prayer. Dorothy Zola was a theologian and Lutheran minister. She lived through and after World War II and wrestled with what did it mean to be Christian in her time? What did it mean to claim the name of God when Christianity had actually been complicit in the Shoah, in the Holocaust? She talked a lot about prayer. And one of the things she noted was how God has no other hands but ours. So when we pray this prayer, it's not just about like, oh great, prayed my prayer, I'm good, I'm done. No, because as we are opened, as we see, we then live our lives as response. If we pray for the kingdom, should we not then live as if the kingdom is real? I heard that amen or yes. <laughs> That's the invitation to us to open ourselves and our hands then to the rhythm of this God and to move in it, right? They will know we are Christians by our love because we have known love, therefore we live love. Prayer reminds us that love is the only thing that is real and we know that in Christ and we live that then as people who long for the kingdom and have seen it in part. And yet to pray to know how to live in this world, it can be painful and challenging and real and hard. And so also as we pray, we come together to do that one with another, 
right? If we're continually praying, then our lives are also the reaffirmation to one another. Keep going, keep loving, keep risking, keep wrestling. I'm just going to quote all of the values, right? We do that because we live our lives as prayer and remind one another, calling each other to live in that rightness and relationship with God. Dorothy Zola wrote a lot of poem prayers because, again, she believed that there was something about poetry that opened us up and freed us from the ways in which our minds can get so locked in in the dailiness, right? Prayer does that. It opens us up again to take some breaths in the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of the scrolling news. We take a breath and rediscover the God of breath and of life. One of Dorothy's prayer poems is entitled, When He Came. He needs you. That's all there is to it. Without you, he's left hanging. Goes up in Dachau smoke. Is sugar and spice in the baker's hands gets revalued in the next stock market crash. He's consumed and blown away, used up without you. Help him. That's what faith is. He can't bring it about his kingdom. Couldn't then, couldn't later, couldn't now. Not at any rate without you. And that is his irresistible appeal. And so the author of Luke reminds us to be a people who open the door, who move into the space and rhythm with the God of all love, to pray without ceasing, to live our lives as prayer, and to let our hands and our feet and our lips become the response that we sing, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today, O oh God, what we need and remind us that we have been forgiven. So let us then generously forgive. And don't let us forget Keep us from the evil that would keep us from you. For God, you are all things. And to all that is and will be of your kingdom, we say yes, which is amen. Amen.
This morning for our call to generosity, I am delighted to welcome, oh, excuse me, to welcome Steve Coleman from, the, from our generosity team to come up and give us a little update. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, and it is a, a good day filled with generosity. Our generosity ministry action team seeks to work with all of you to identify, to celebrate, and to deepen and broaden all forms of generosity that we see and experience in this congregation. So we have a request, an opportunity, an assignment for you. This week, today, tonight, Monday, Tuesday, look around for signs of generosity. We want to see, recognize, elevate, encourage things that are being done to love and serve others in the name of Jesus. And why do we do this? Because it's good. It's good for the person that receives the help, and it blesses the person who's giving. And it's an example. And so here's your assignment. Wednesday, in the e-news, scroll to the bottom, and you will find a request that invites all of you, any of you, to find and remember and send us words or a little video of 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something that you have seen that was generous. And what are we going to do with that? We're going to put it into our video library so that we have an expanding archive of generous things that will serve as an example and an opportunity for many of us to step into and expand our own generosity. So look in the e-news this Wednesday. Send us stories that you recognize in other people. This is not about you. It's what you see in other people. And so we invite you to do that this week and we'll produce and then share with you as we go through week by week examples of generosity that will be an encouragement to all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And Steve is actually going to race off so he can also give that announcement in alternative worship right now. Um, but I would like to just remind everyone that if you're feeling generous, there are many ways to give. Um, first, you can give online, go to the website, it will lead you there. Secondly, and this is especially true maybe for the live stream crowd, um, you can give from your mobile phone. And uh, the screen has the way to do that right there. And then thirdly, you can always do the good traditional envelope. Um, and we collect the envelopes back in the, north, in the gathering space. So, as we consider the generosity around us, as we take notice of the generosity among us, as we consider ways that we can give, let us gather our hearts and pray. Holy God, as you tell us to rejoice always and be thanks in all circumstances, you also remind us that our generosity can be a radical act of faithfulness to you. And so turn our hearts to grateful love and help us to share our generosity with a world that is truly broken and in need. We pray this today in your holy name. Amen.
Well, as we go forth uh, in person here, there is Christian's class that you can join in, and you can also join that online. And there are also donuts and coffee in the North Common, so we invite you to partake of that and maybe grab some more coffee if you're online and be in touch that way. As we go forth this day in the rhythm of faith, in the rhythm of prayer, maybe take some time to just notice. Maybe you're scrolling and you notice a feeling. Make that a prayer. Pay attention to that longing. As you seek to show up in relationship, let that be a prayer. Might we indeed be a people who live as if the kingdom, that door is flung open wide. Go, therefore, in the love of God, in the peace of the Spirit, as we follow Jesus with all that we are. Amen.